Yeah, thanks very much for coming. So my name is Omar Adnan Chowdhury. I'm an artist who's based out in Dhaka, Bangladesh now. I moved there last year. Um, and the talk that I'm giving, which Jen sort of covered the title of, uh, really concerns a strain of cinema which I think has become really important in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which I'm sort of calling uh, personal cinema or a cinema of sort of personal attention. And it's situated in the midst of what's been the dominant trend in art cinema over the last 15 to 20 years, which is sort of contemplative cinema or slow cinema. Um, filmmakers such as uh, Abhichat Pong, who I'll be talking about, um, Pedro Costa and so on, uh, sort of in this uh, line, uh, Gia Zenke, uh, and before that, going to Kiristami in the 90s. Um, and there's quite a bit of a tradition uh, of that, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about later. So uh, the kind of rough structure that way, this is the only slide I have, by the way, but I do have some clips, so don't get too uh, scared. Um, so I'll be showing some clips as well, uh, but first I'll be covering um, what I've called the journey. Um, I'm not really a, a lecturer in film or philosophy, so I'm uh, an artist, so um, what I'm about to say will be pretty personal, and it's really about my personal journey to this kind of art and this kind of filmmaking. Uh, so I'll be talking about that and how I came to it. And I'll be talking about the foundations of what I think this new form of cinema uh, is, this sort of personal form of cinema. And then three aspects which I think are p particularly important about them. And that's uh, how this sort of cinema deals with truth and what kind of truth it deals with, how it deals with time, and the last thing is how it deals with things and people and models being... Um, an aspect of that. I guess it's probably best to start off with, um, I came here when I was six years old. My parents uh, migrated from, um, or is it emigrated, uh, from Bangladesh. And one of the things that I think remains when something like that happens to you at that age is you realize how contingent so many of the rules and assumptions of our lives are. So, you know, this year in Bangladesh, uh, I'd be eating a lot of the times with my hands. And you just come here and you think, wow, eating with a fork and spoon, it's like it's, you don't think about it ever. But there's just other ways of being. And for a young kid, it's, it was quite disjunctive um, in a way to realize that the things you were being taught, well, there are other ways to live. And I think that may have been one of the things which uh, meant I can't work a normal job. And, um, and I won't have much money in my life and have to do this. Um, so uh, I, th I think that's one of the things that really got me interested in finding out a uh, sense of truth. Now, before I'd read any theory or anything like that, and I still haven't read much theory, which is maybe a good thing. Um, but I am interested in finding out um, whatever truths I can about the world and the best version of the truth. So uh, I, I worked in did a computer science degree, industrial relations sort of degree, and worked in those fields for nine to 10 years, but started making uh, more work, firstly in photography. Um, and then when I raised a bit of money, um, I s made two short films, uh, which I wanted to do in a very traditional style. I wanted to understand how films were made using the classic modes and apparatuses of filmmaking. So we, uh, uh, Kate, who was one of uh, my producers, um, who's here now, uh, we went around and interviewed like seven directors of photography. We negotiated for 14 or 15 locations and so on. So we did everything the way you were supposed to do them. And this 12-minute film, it was called a mission, this 12-minute film took nine months of my life, and that's all I did to make. And it was, uh, it was four days of shooting, and it went beautifully and uh, sort of perfectly, but um, you always have the post-making blues, for those of you, you know, you, you aim for a certain goal and then you kind of achieve it and then it's a big bummer. Um, and in that sort of post-finishing uh, depression, I was, um, I was like, I didn't really enjoy that very much at all. The actual making part of it, the actual filmmaking, those four days, that all of the work had been done previous to those four days and the actual creation happened at this remove at this abstracted level, not in the process itself, which, which I didn't feel was the right thing. And I felt like I, was, I had made up a lot of stuff, which perhaps wasn't really there where we shot. And around this time, I, um, I should have this much closer, shouldn't I? Because <laughs> it makes such a difference. 
Um, around that time, I ran across a filmmaker called Pedro Costa, who I think um, is recognized as a master now after the Vanda trilogy. He's a Portuguese filmmaker who works out of Lisbon. And he actually had a similar trajectory to the one I had, but at a, at a larger level. He'd made three, um, three films which were very much in the line of European art cinema. They were done with relatively big crews and so on. But um, at his third film, which is called Ossos, he was shooting it in uh, uh, some Lisbon slums which were being um, demolished at the same time. And he went there initially to just what's called wrecking, so just having a look at what's there for the first month, and mostly by himself, and just saw a lot of these beautiful transactions and personalities and um, phenomena, uh, which when he went there with a crew, because filmmaking is so intrusive and it's so obtrusive that it has this huge effect on the environment that you're filming. And when he came there with the two trucks of lights and lit the whole place up, uh, a lot of what was really attractive about it, a lot of what was magical sort of disappeared. And there was one um, young lady who uh, was a heroin addict who was, had a slight role in the film. Um, at the end of the filming, and he'd gotten slowly uh, felt worse and worse about it during the filming, at the end of the film came to him and said, you know, you filmed something here, but I don't think you really filmed this place. If you ever do feel like filming this place for real, um, then come back, but just by yourself, and we'll make a film together. And so he went away and had these huge fights with his producers uh, about um, the film, and uh, I think he'd lost faith in it at that point, and that's awful in film because you've spent a year or two years of your life, and if you lose faith in it for that last bit, it can be very difficult. And I th uh, the film finally got released, but um, he wanted to find a new way of filmmaking, and so he bought a Panasonic little handycam camera and went back to the slums and spoke to Vanda, who's the name of the young lady, um, and just started filming them by himself, and then a sound person uh, joined him later. And that was really interesting to me as I was looking at my bank account and the rising rents in Sydney and the possibility of making work all the time and learning. Uh, I looked at that as an example and thought, you know, I could, I could do that. And not only could I do it, but that seems like such an ambitious conception of what film can now do or what, can film, what, what film can do in the future. So I sort of packed my bags after that and bought a Handycam uh, camera and went to Bangladesh to make one of the works that's uh, up there, but uh, far longer work as well. So that's what made me sort of come to uh, this sort of personal cinema of um, one person's experience uh, being captured. And really the way to, way to communicate it is um, the analogy to, what I'm really interested in is how a painter works or how a writer works. And in terms of how they work, it's what they feel when they're doing the work that they do, the fact that they're alone. And then this, there's this amazing feeling when you're alone, whether that's loneliness or just aloneness or whatever it is, that you can't obviously access when there's a big film crew around you. You can maybe when you're writing the film, but again, there's that level of abstraction away from when you're actually making it. So I was very interested in, well, can I feel the same things that a writer feels when he's writing, but can I do it with film? And what kind of films would that make? So the filmmakers we're going to be looking at, I'll be showing some clips, um, I think very much encapsulate that idea of a personal view of um, the world being captured on film. I'm going to show you a quick little clip from someone I respect a lot, whose name is Frederick Wiseman. He's a documentary maker who's been working for a very long time, about 40 to 50 years. I think he's about 80, late 80s now, and he's still making films. I think his last film was Crazy Horse, which was shot at a, um, at a club in Paris, a dancing club. It's about five, six minutes. I don't know. 
The point of that film is you can't do anything with art, I think. That's what it's saying. 
so the, the reason I sort of uh, played that clip is be, to contextualize uh, the fact that this for, form of cinema has existed before in sort of different guises or parts of it has existed before. So Frederick Wiseman obviously works in a, in a documentary fashion, although he calls his work documentary fictions. Um, even before him, say with the new realists such as Rossellini and so on, who took the camera out uh, in sort of post-war Italy, took it out onto the streets uh, and put it in a real environment and out of studios and so on, although of course that had been done before by Lumiere's and so on, uh, Lumiere's. One of the real big innovations recently, and Godard uh, experimented in this fashion as well for a number of films, but the really interesting thing that's been happening is fiction filmmakers have been taking uh, the camera out and working in a similar way to have sort of the, the least amount of impact in the environment around them to capture these things which would be nearly impossible or very difficult to capture um, in any other guise. So uh, this idea of personal experience um, and that doesn't include just sensorial experiences but um, personal experience in terms of our dreams and so on. We'll see from the clip from Lissandro Alonso, for example. But what it is, is it's really coming from how an individual is looking at a situation or looking at the world. Another aspect of this is what it doesn't have and what you throw away, I think, to work in this fashion. Uh, a lot of these filmmakers uh, do not work with scripts. Uh, in fact, a lot of, not just in this uh, strain, but in uh, a lot of art cinema, scripts have become passe in a way. It's something you have to do uh, for producers uh, and um, the mechanisms of getting funding and so on. But as funding requirements have gone down, um, a lot of filmmakers have, I think, realised that words are not pictures and that you're getting away from the essence of the medium by working in a scriptural fashion. And that there are many other sort of ways which are simpler, maybe just making plan, you know, you can have, for my work, for example, I have Excel spreadsheets where I write a story about a, a scene or take pictures of it or draw something. And there's this plethora of ways that you can describe what it is that you're going to actually make at the end, which is closer to what it is that you're going to be making in the end, which is the goal, that you want to be actually, the ideal thing is to work in the medium itself, so to create in film. So someone like, uh, so like Charlie Chaplin, for example, he did all his rehearsals in the camera itself, um, not sort of separately. He'd have a rough, rough script. And what you get from that is you're saying, it's, it's like a painter who, you know, you can do a lot of studies and so on, but at one point you have to go and paint the thing. And then you scrap it and you start again. Or a writer who will try out a sentence over and over again. And I find that crucial and one of the big limitations in film for me was the fact that it was so hard to try again that you often get two takes because the camera takes 15 minutes to move from one from there to over there it'll take 15 minutes to move and I just thought there's another way there's other forms of uh, truth that you can get at um, if you could work quicker and work simpler so uh, that's about scripts the other thing that I'm really interested in, and you know, this is one of the first times I'm showing my work in, uh, I guess, a gallery context in a sort of an art exhibition instead of screening them in film screenings, is because I'm very interested, um, and I describe this with a pretty simplistic model, but if you think of a continuum with uh, narrative film on one side and on the other sort of the experiential nature of art, so you walk up to a sculpture and you experience it sort of directly. Whereas a lot of film, not all of course, but um, a lot of film has a strong narrative core which makes you care about certain aspects and their histories and their futures, right? Like a certain character, you have, you'll care about their futures. And so, but once you start caring about a character's future or their past, you're not, it takes a little away from what you're seeing right then, what's in that frame right then. So it takes away something from the experience which doesn't happen as much in art. And so what I was really interested in is where, how far can I push film towards the experiential nature of art? And the filmmakers we'll be looking at, people like Api Pong, who work in both uh, in art and film, I think have gained a lot about how much and what kind of different experiences you can communicate through film if uh, you flatten the image. And what I mean by that is if you take away the narrative imperative. So, uh, when you take away the story of what's going to happen to this character, 
what becomes, what happens is instead of, if you've got a frame with the character in it, instead of the character just being the thing in focus, the tree next to the character becomes as important. Um, we're going to be talking about this in the last section and things. But by flattening out the frame, you start making things like paintings would give overall sort of experiences. Which doesn't mean, and one thing I've coming to realize, it doesn't mean throwing all narrative away because there's a great power in narrative and it can keep you for a much longer time. I'm not interested in giving just experiences, say you can from a sculpture. I am interested in some stories, but I want to make those stories quite slight and I think that's what these uh, filmmakers are doing themselves. Uh, another thing I want to say just about, uh, you know, when you're, when you're sort of emerging and trying to find out what it is that you're actually interested in, and a lot of these filmmakers are obviously very interested in renewing themselves because they work at the apex of the avant-garde, um, is finding out what it is that you actually really like. Not what's expected of you or not what maybe the market wants, which is, which is fine if, if that's the area you work in. Uh, not what your producer wants or, or uh, the travails of art history and, what, and where you might be in that. So as you get rid of things like scripts and producers and so on, and you shorten the process of how quickly you can look at the work that you're making, it's much, and you've got less to lose in each take, it's much easier to get at who it is that you really are, the kind of art that you actually want to make and that actually makes you happy because you've got all these other things out of the way, which I think for any part of someone's career is very important, but it's really important at the start because it's easy to get very distracted. Um, so next we're going to go on to those three sort of aspects of this kind of filmmaking that I talked about and that's uh, how it deals with uh, truth and time and uh, things and people. And I want to show a clip uh, for this first section, uh, Truth, and the clip is from a filmmaker called Lissandro Alonso. And it's a film called Los Mayotas and we're kind of interested in how he's using time. This is the start of the film.
basically follows him throughout his journey into a jungle. Um, and it's very much just concentrated on him. Oh yeah, he kills stuff. I'll just stop it there. So one, one thing uh, that I think these filmmakers are really interesting once they go into this sort of uh, idea of personal experience is how we experience time. And it's really, really variable. Time is this super stretchy thing where, um, you know, if you're waiting to be, uh, I don't know, what's the memory that comes up, waiting to be punished by the vice principal or something at school and you're just waiting outside his office and time just feels like it's utterly elongated. Um, or you've got five, you know, half an hour with your girlfriend before she's going to fly off and then suddenly time is like five seconds. And uh, when you throw away things like narrative and so on, you can start concentrating on these things which are far more about form um, than about story. And that's, say, a conception of time. And I think what it does is it lets in far more of life. You know, when you read a something by Flaubert or so on, and, and you're just amazed by how much of life he's been able to capture, or Tolstoy. Um, I think it's very important for cinema to get away just from story so that we can start adding what's, I think, a fundamental strength of the medium, which is capturing these things which are beyond words. Um, there's another sort of concept here of biases, you know, uh, I've been doing all this reading around um, neuropsychology and so on and how many biases we have. And a camera is this amazing tool to get past your biases, right? Um, uh, nearly in a, in, a, in a Zen way where a camera which comes along with you has another perspective on seeing um, the situation that is in front of you, the one that you're experiencing. So it's a bit, it's a bit like I've got this other person along with me and I'm experiencing the thing and seeing certain things and directing it, sure. But it's doing its thing as well. And then when we go back to, uh, to edit, it's like I've got a comparison to what I saw versus what it saw. And I find that really interesting because there's all of, a lot of my biases get pointed out. Um, some of it falls outside the frame. Maybe I didn't point because it was outside, but a lot of it does get captured and I find that uh, quite interesting. Um, and, and I think uh, that, kind of, that kind of truth of feeling, so when you look at that clip, for example, just to uh, illustrate these two ideas, um, one of the ideas I was talking about is this flatness, where he will treat the forest as importantly as he does uh, the murder of these two kids. And that's very important, not just in terms of theoretics of connecting those two things together elementally, but um, in terms of the feeling you get from watching it uh, and the balance that that murder has versus the, the permanence of existence itself. But also in terms of time, there's, there's two shots there. So that one shot which is floating around and it's nearly like a dreamscape or a conception of time within dreams itself. And then it cuts, it, it goes to green, and then it cuts to another form of time, I think, which is far sharper, where you can just see him sort of scratching at the, at the wall, and time seems far more defined. So it's not just a matter of time being long or short, it's being, time being diffuse or, or concrete as well. So there are a lot of these very interesting concepts that these filmmakers can explore because it's, it's not just a script. Of course, I, I feel like I'm giving, uh, it's, you know, making a script or no script. That's not a thing. And there's always been a continuum of filmmakers working more in this direction or more in the other direction. Um, it's just I feel that some of the most interesting, exciting work has been from the marriage or the, the dyadic nature of um, what's coming from art and, and installations and so on. Uh, another thing I want to say about time is uh, time actually heals, in a sense, where you need things inside you, your body or, or your heart or whatever it might be, you need to give it time to, to fix itself. Now, that exists in, exists in cinema as, as well, I think, where uh, what you'll find filmmakers do, Pedro Costa is a, is a very good example. Um, I really recommend uh, on Rouge magazine, he has a two-day masterclass where, which has been written up. It's an amazing essay, but, uh, which he gave in Tokyo. And he talks about how he wants to push the viewer away from the screen. Because film is so palpable, because it is so experiential, you get lost in it, right? Like you go to see Batman and 
it's all explosions and the very um, basic um, mechanical aspects of being a human being, like being scared or being excited or whatever, are being, and they're very good at using those. Um, but there are other bits of being human beings as well, which is sort of deep reflection or deep emotion or even deep intellection, um, which is important to get at. And often sort of mainstream cinema doesn't uh, go in, uh, doesn't really attack those, but this form of cinema is, is really structured towards um, attacking. And it's not just a, f it's also not just a matter of those different kinds of truths, whether it's emotional, intellectual, so on. But I think what this kind of cinema does by not saying things to you, but letting you kind of discover, is it lets you find out a far better form of the truth, which isn't which isn't a split one, where emotional truth and intellectual truth sort of uh, combine to what I think is a far, far realer version of the truth. And it's something that you construct automatically because, again, it's, it's, it's beyond assertions and it's beyond words. Of course, you film anything, it's an assertion, but uh, it's, it's, it's positioned backwards, if you like. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say uh, about time. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, sorry, so that's uh, truth and time. The next thing, the last sort of section is things. And I'm kind of including people um, in that as well. And I'm going to show you a clip uh, by uh, Apichat Pongwara Sithikul, who's a Thai filmmaker you guys might be highly aware of. He's super famous now. Yeah, so um, 
we spoke about it before in terms of flattening out a frame. Um, it's actually really, really hard to make objects look like objects in a film. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a serious challenge because as soon as you have, um, as soon as you have this concept of time or multiple frames, people start making narratives. Like we're this narrative making machine, right? We're constantly making narratives about our lives. Uh, how, who we are, how did that happen, or what's going to happen next, or what the person we like thinks or is thinking. And so to make people just kind of stop and look at things is, is a, a real challenge in time-based media. And, um, and what Apishapong does is, you, you know, like in that, in that shot, there's like the shot of the roof and there's microfiber written there. And I've never looked at like a logo, maybe in that way, in that, in, in that conception of beauty and so on. And the fact that he can do that, that he can concentrate on that and cu create this aura of feel about objects is, I think, an amazing thing to aim for because we experience those things personally all the time when we're alone, when we're not involved in achieving things, when we're not involved in wanting and so on. Um, our body just experiences this stuff and it's by letting go of this attainment and I kind of see narratives as a form of attainment, of having to get somewhere um, or get, letting go of a lot of that which opens up these, these uh, pathways. Um, so really figuring out what's sort of really there and showing that on screen. Now, uh, of course, a big part of making any film is working with uh, models or actors and really showing them. And when you don't, when you aren't as obsessed with characters or character development or um, what a character will be doing, what you start doing is you start finding out who that person standing in front of you and your camera actually is from the wrinkles on their face which you can explore with your camera, to the way they move, to the way the sounds that they make when they exert themselves. So there's really far more subtle forms of knowledge about another person, which I think may in some ways be the only thing that's there, if you think that just reality right now is the only thing that's there. Um, that being able to capture that is, I think, is a really big deal and, and something um, uh, that these filmmakers are, are concentrating, concentrating on. And the other thing I want to say again is go back to the apparatus of film and about this sort of minimalist filmmaking of going down to... So I, I went to Bangladesh and made stonework and that was just me out there. But I've, for this next film, which is far larger, it's about 80 hours of footage now, it'll be around two hours at the end, uh, I had a crew of three or four people. And I think for the next one, uh, it will be larger slightly again. So it's not a matter of just you experiencing. I mean, it doesn't mean no one can be around you. It's just about being hyper-aware of who that is and the feeling that you have and that's going on inside you um, and being very involved in that, in that process rather than all the logistical stuff around it which is one of the big dangers of film that it becomes too much logistics rather than the other thing. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing just to clarify something I said earlier around truth and then I'll be wrapping up um, and that's show you a clip which isn't the most amazing clip in the world, but it's um, from something we're shooting out in Bangladesh.
So I'm just going to stop it there and just explain to you a little bit of what's going on. Um, so what we were able to do, for example, is um, this is a real council meeting at a, at a small town in Bangladesh. And we just sort of turned up and you have so much freedom that um, we just said we'd like to shoot something here. And we came back the next day and this is a real council meeting that's going on. Um, but yeah, we've placed sort of this guy in the fire shed and he's one of our actions, the son of the main of the main leader of the film. And there's another person who's coming in who's in the papers. Um, and so we're sort of computing the fictional elements into something real. So, so, what we, um, so what we were able to do is, is put this fictional element and see how it plays with the real stuff that's going on. So one thing that happens is when he gets these papers, this guy, who's a real person living a real life, and not in the film, in a sense, not part of our film, looks over at the papers that he's been given. And it's nearly like reality is validating our idea of fiction, or the idea that we've had, right? Idea that we've had about fiction. And there's a lot of this sort of interplay in the frame itself um, that you can do, and the other filmmakers uh, do as well, when you have a look at their process, that uh, I find uh, really, really um, interesting. Um, and also an interesting direction to go for experimentation, I think. Okay, um, that sort of uh, covers what I want to talk about. So, um, you know, uh, this sort of personal uh, cinema, uh, a minimalist personal cinema that's really based off of the experiences that a single sort of soul or a consciousness feels. And, uh, and we obviously talk about some of the foundations of it. Um, and three things that I think are super important, which is how truth is dealt with in this form of cinema. Um, the range of things you can do with time once you start looking at it from a personal individual's point of view um, and not from the imperatives of narrative and, uh, and how things and people are also sort of um, uh, represented. Thanks. Thank you very yeah. much, Adnan. Cool. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it.